My guest today is Simran Jindal, executive partner IBM Consulting Northern Europe. With more than 20 years of international experience across Asia, North America and Europe, Simran has been responsible for delivering technology solutions across industry verticals. LinkedIn recognized Simran as a top leadership voice through her contributions and writing on the platform. Simran is a passionate advocate of financial inclusion for women through autonomy and literacy. She's an active angel investor in women-led businesses and limited partner in private equity firms focusing on climate, tech, healthcare, future of work and retail reinvention. Wow. That's a lot of accomplishment. Simran and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Welcome to Atlanta Diaries. Thank you me too. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Awesome. So the first question which comes to my mind is your passion about financial literacy. You know, I can understand coming from a banker or somebody from pure finance, but coming from a tech person, sort of love to hear from you why this cause resonated with you so much and its importance. So let's start with uh, you know financial independence firstly. I'm raised by a single mother and unfortunately she never got the opportunity to work. So even though she had a lot of financial support from her family and her ex-husband, she never got to doing anything on her own and while there was everything but at the same time there was an always this constant element of dependency not being able to make your own decision and i think a lot of it i inherited as well for many many years because i had a very fearful relationship with money until i as you say you know took the bull by the horn and started educating myself and understanding that how money is a tool and how women should learn and start focusing on not just earning but also investing and then over the years of you know experience across the world and working and i met so many women and i realized that while we have a lot more women in the workforce and they are making real good money but still unclear to them how to build wealth how to think about future so you know that's essentially is the deep rooted emotion and that's why it's so close to my heart as i've seen the impact of that first hand personally in my own life but i also want to take the opportunity to clarify one big myth it is not the bankers who are the best financially literate people bankers are also doing their jobs in the banks and the banks are giving them the products that they need to sell to the customers and many of the bankers have no clue what they're selling to the customers so that's a huge myth that you're not in the finance sector so therefore you shouldn't have interest in money i think everybody should have interest in money and should learn basics and even learn enough that you can even challenge your bankers and your investment advisors and even say no to them and it happens with me a lot that now people from the bank that i operate with and if they make suggestions i'm reading and analyzing and i'm asking questions so many a times you say no that you know that this is not sort of part of my investment personality that i would like to continue with i think we need to educate the world not just the women i appreciate that and probably this conversation is making me see my blind spots You know, let's backtrack a little bit, Simran. Share with us some headlines of your early years, and what do you think were the factors behind this success, this ambition, this passion to do more and more? Yeah, so I think when you're, you know, younger, as I mentioned earlier, raised by a single mother, so there was this constant, you know, emotion that you have to do something with your life. You cannot be dependent on anybody, and that stayed. forever until today but i think the definition of ambition and success has changed before i had a checklist and i would do one thing and then i would go into the next and you know there was also to a point of almost a maniacal obsession if something wasn't achieved i will work extra hard to find a way to make it happen now you could say that was also needed at the time to get to the point where i am today but the most important accomplishment that i have is an independent mind independent thought process the ability to go and read and reach out to people and talk and discuss and just build that point of view which i think is extremely important and specifically when we are talking about you know women there's one part of it that we say that okay a lot of women are not heard but then there's another part of it that a lot of women must also spend a lot of time in having a point of view and being comfortable in also having a different opinion because rejection is not dislike you know you can have two different opinions and you can 
stay with yours and somebody else can stay with theirs and you can still move forward. So I think that is the accomplishment I personally feel that I have, that learning from others' opinions as well while having my own and then adapting and building a new opinion on that. So you grew up in an environment where English was not the first language. And you also mentioned that you didn't speak fluent English until high school. So to me, that was a very, very telling sign on what all effort you made to do what you did. So can you share with us that experience? What all did you do to make your voice heard? Well, I actually have no memory on, you know, what triggered that thought that I need to work on it. But I remember absolutely vividly that when that realization happened and I did not know what to do, how to go about it. And even though English was not the primary language at home, there was a Times of India and then there was the Hindi newspaper. They both used to come. So I quietly just took the English paper and I started reading and picked the articles and I would read in front of the mirror like, I'm a newsreader. So not often I made sense of everything I was reading, but I think that was my very vivid memory of what I did. And I think that effort continues today. So that's what I learned in that journey. And I didn't do it out of any fear or any worry or anxiety. I just realized, oh, I'm a good at it. So I need to figure this out and I need to do something about it. So the best I knew, I did it. Could I have seeked help? Maybe. But in that moment, I didn't feel like I needed help. I just needed to do it myself. It has helped me is that the effort continues. I'm still curious every time I'm reading and I come across, you know, some exciting word and that kind of rings a bell in my ear and I want to learn about it. So I learn it and I start using it in my vocabulary. And then since we also moved to Sweden and at an adult age, I also learned a third language. So that was also very helpful to Pick it up really quickly, not worry about how am I coming across, because even in English, people have gazillion accents, but we still understand each other. So it's the same thing when you're learning any other language, you know, you just sort of stop worrying about the accents or how am I coming across. As long as what I'm saying, you're able to understand, that's what matters. But I really don't remember when and what made me realize that I need to do this, but something definitely was there. But something did also make you realize that you're capable of more. Right. So what I want to really unpack is how did you think through your career path? Yeah, I went to a private school and that was my mother's decision, even if it was something beyond that she thought she could afford. But she prioritized that. And then when I finished grade 10, I realized I need to change my school because I needed a different environment. And then I ended up going to a great university in Delhi. And every time I had a realization, I need to do this. And I focused on going ahead and, you know, doing it. So the other thing is also putting yourself in an environment that is better than you are. So you're not getting too complacent and too comfortable. So when I went to this high school for two years, you know, in that moment, it felt out of my league. So you kind of keep upping your game. It's almost like a rubber band. You're stretching yourself. And I outsmarted everybody as far as I remember, (laughs) you know, and then university, I went to Delhi Hindu College, which is one of the top colleges in that university. And there was nobody from my school who had gone there or had taken up economics. But I met some great friends and people coming from very different families, much wealthier than, you know, I had grown up and much higher confidence than I thought I had. But that's another moment of stretching yourself. It feels like your stomach is churning all the time, but waking up every day, going and doing well. And I also did one other thing that I studied computer science in parallel. So I didn't have a lot of time to worry about, am I liked or am I not liked? Am I part of this group or another group? In the morning, I would go to the university from 8 to 12. And then from 12, I would take a public transport and get to other end of Delhi to go and study my computer science with National Institute of Information Technology. So I wouldn't be home before 8 p.m., you know, from 8 to 8. So there was not much time to think all of that because you're so busy. Same goes for my executive MBA. I always had that I would like to do. Saw a lot of my university friends after university going and, you know, going to some of the top schools and top business schools in India. And I felt, oh, okay, that's a lot of work. You have to take the CAT exam. And at the time I couldn't afford, you know, the fee as well to go into those schools. Fast forward today, that money is pocket change now. But in that time, it felt completely unaffordable. So I thought, okay, I'll end up doing it, you know, sometime in my life. So it was there in the back of my mind. And I ended up doing it back in 2014 and went to a 
three schools that I could have never imagined that I would be part of. I met some amazing people coming from 100 different nationalities, age group of 34 to 58, people already CEOs, millionaires and billionaires, and you're interacting you know, with them. And I got selected to become a class president, which felt like I wanted to say no to it because I thought I'm just here to study. I don't have time to socialize and lead the class. But I ended up doing it because there was no other female candidate on the list and they were going to go linearly, not jump to another female. And I vividly remember I was drinking a cup of coffee and I swallowed it and said, okay, I'll do it. And that started giving me this real foundation of leadership, working with a class of such diverse people. Beautiful. So Simran, which is the other language you've learned? Swedish. So all these MBAs happened in a span of time or... I was in my late 30s when I went and did this executive MBA. And yeah, when I went to school, I realized that there is really no age span because there were people 10 years younger than me. There were people 10 years older than me, 15 years older than me. So I think it's also giving you that freedom and affirmation that you can learn anytime. So you mentioned you choose complicated and risky over safe choices. Share with us more about it. Yeah. I remember reading Lean In from Sheryl Sandberg back in 2012. And one of the things that struck with me was, you know, pick choices where there is potential for growth. So that's how I've made my decisions in the last 10, 12 years. So I have two criteria that does the role allow me autonomy and space and growth so that I would be able to do more than what the job description says. And the other one is who is the immediate leader I would be working with? And if I think those two things are good and I get a super good vibe, I move forward. I don't overthink, am I going to be compensated well or not? I think that comes as it comes as part of the process. And, you know, there is no perfect salary. There is no perfect revenue for business. The most important thing is finding that combination. And then over time, I've also learned that joy is really important on a day-to-day basis, even when you are having difficult days, difficult moments, because, you know, we are a for-profit business. It's still finding joy in that. You must love it. Only then you can go through the bad days or rather difficult days or difficult decisions or moments that you have to sort of endure. You know, you spoke about turning points when you had a lot of self-awareness. So what was the self-awareness? Yeah. One is self-awareness within you, your own self-awareness, that you know yourself, you know what you're capable of, or you know what you're willing to put in the effort to do something. The other awareness comes from when other people tell you how they see you, because not often it's the same perception. You may have a perception about yourself, but it's really important to pay attention to how others are perceiving you. So I've had a couple of moments where other people perceived me more than I thought I was aiming for. I remember vividly one of my employers, the CIO was leaving and he asked me if I would be interested so he could put my name forward. So it was a mid-sized company and I'd just been there for a year. And I was kind of a bit shocked that really he thinks I can be the CIO. And I know that my reaction didn't come across as super excited, but it's just because internally I was having that dialogue. So that was one moment back in 2013 that I realized, okay, I think I need to change certain things to feel that within me. And then I remember another colleague when I came to IBM, he came and told me, Simran, you need to learn to aim higher. And I thought I was already doing it. Yeah. (laughs) Something was missing, right? So clearly I was not giving the impression where either I was aiming low or maybe I was not communicating that. So I think those moments I paid a lot of attention and of course continued with my own learning journey. But I also took help through coaches and, you know, talked it through with people around senior leaders who were very vested in my growth. And that helped me a lot in, you know, combining that self-awareness of what I know, what I am, and then also how am I being perceived and what tiny tweaks do I need to make. And communication, of course, plays an extremely important role. I really like the way you sort of talked about the importance of knowing oneself and understanding personal limits regarding stress and workload, right? So, you know, you said you reach your peak and then you seek help. So can you share the anecdote or experiences that shaped your understanding of that balance? So I think, again, here it's about 
paying attention to when we get very uncomfortable in our body. What causes stress, really? I mean, there are moments you could be working 24 hours and you're not stressed, but then there are moments you work five hours and you could be very stressed, right? So I think when I had that realization, I started paying attention to what is it that's making me feel that discomfort if I am procrastinating or if I am putting off things that I know I have to do, it could be purely because I don't like to do that kind of or that type of work or I need help or whatever the reason. That is the number one cause of stress for me. And the second other cause of stress for me when I have not exercised. When I'm exercising, my sort of brain is calm and I can think clearly. So I have to really pay attention that if I've missed exercise for a good number of days, could be due to travels or sometimes just busy days, I have to bring it back to schedule and, you know, prioritize. And the third thing now, the most important is sleep. I cannot emphasize the importance of sleep. I think when we are younger, we underestimate that and we take it so lightly. Fortunately, in my home, we are all very sleep disciplined. I have become one. I wasn't like that when I was younger. I guard sleep, whether now it's travel, not traveling, you know, super early morning, going the night before, making sure that I have, you know, a full night's sleep. So it's not really the work. It's not really the difficulty. It's not really the time. It's not the hours because I'm, I can be very passionate and obsessed and I can work long hours. It doesn't matter. And if there's anything I'm procrastinating for more than, let's say, two weeks, I will talk it through with my team. And I will say, look, this is on my agenda. I'm procrastinating it. And I don't know why. And if there's anybody who can help me so we can move forward, then we get going. So it becomes a bit of a shared responsibility as well. And I encourage also the team to do it. And one of the things I've learned is that don't suffer alone. There are people out there to help you. And asking for help is the biggest strength, not a weakness. Something inside me is holding me back or it's stopping me. I think we have to bring it to the table. We have to do it more in our professional cultures as well, creating that space where people can say, it's not my strength. I'm not good at that. I need help, you know, and I will contribute in another manner. So not, I don't get stressed. I can get a bit uncomfortable or a little anxious because I have something on my mind, but not stressed to the point that it would impact my well-being and health. Simran, you've lived in so many different countries. I am now, of course, settled down in Sweden. So how did you navigate these changes? I mean, I can relate to you from India to the US and before that Southeast Asia. But when I moved to the US, you know, and I attended my first coaching conference, everybody's like, wow, you moved from India? And I'm like, I didn't even think it was a big deal. So for the benefit of all our listeners here who find it hard to push themselves out of that comfort zone, you know, love for you to share how did you navigate these changes and, you know, build this successful career? Yeah. Again, I don't know where this came from in my mind, but I built this philosophy that when you move to another place, you're the guest. So you have to go and tell people that I'm here. Normally, when we are living in our home environment, everybody knows each other. You have a social network. You go, people know you, you feel very welcomed. When you go in another environment, in addition to, of course, adapting yourself to some degree. I don't think you have to adapt 360 degrees for a new culture because then you're blending in and you're losing your own identity. I think you have to balance that. You have to be very culturally aware, absolutely, and very aware of what you bring to the table. So for me, that mindset somehow got cultivated that I'm the guest. If I'm new, if I really want to reach out to somebody, I want to talk to somebody, you know, I will reach out. I would not hold myself back that Somebody, you know, will come and be friends with me or it's their job to, you know, come and talk to me. I think that mentality still stays even after very soon. I think next year we'll be living in Sweden for 20 years. I think I go anywhere in any room, in any conversation, feeling like it's my job to inform who I am. And let's start from there. And then I think one thing leads to the other. And cultural awareness is also part of adapting. And you pick the best of all the cultures, right? And be very aware of the things that you don't appreciate and be very open about it. I think that part has been the most easiest for me to just, you know, as we say, flow like water. I think I just adapted. So any, you know, stories of cultural shock, for lack of a better word, or, you know, just like you said, pick up the best part of all cultures. Yeah, not so much of a shock, but yeah, definitely an adaptation, like in Scandinavia, long summer vacations. 
So I remember when, you know, we had moved in the first couple of years, I found that very uncomfortable because you're not grown up and three, four, five weeks of vacation at all one go, you know, and we have six weeks annual vacation plus all these other holidays, etc. So that was one thing that it took me some time to adapt. I still can't take a four week vacation. I think two weeks is good for me. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying that, oh, we must go back to the job. But I, as a personality, I can work all seven days as long as I have time for the work and also my private life. Time with my family, I can go exercise, I can go read. So as long as I can blend the two, I don't personally have the need for going off the grid. So that's an adaptation is that while I don't have the need, but in the environment, this is how it operates. So it needs patience when my other friends or colleagues are completely off the grid. Um, so I have to respect and I have to wait when they are back, you know, on the grid. And the other one is, I think, a lot of space for yourself. So Scandinavia is a culture I have learned is very accepting of everybody. You know, you live your life the way you live and others live the life they live. We are not judging and questioning each other. And when we are in a professional environment, we are the grown-ups and professional people that we would be, regardless of whichever part of the world you would be, right? There is a professional code of conduct that you have globally. So I think that has definitely been a very positive adaptation for both ensuring you have your space and making sure that others have their space. Uh, there is a myth that people in uh, Scandinavia are cold or they they don't make friends. There are some amazing people, amazing friends I've made over the years. But the perception that sort of built for them is because nobody will knock your door before informing you. And that's, I think, is extremely important because that's respect for privacy. Yeah. Nobody will walk into your house on a weekend without first scheduling it. And then I think culturally, there's a lot of time given to families. The shops close at well, now it's much better because it closes at eight. But when we moved there, they, they would close at 5 p.m. And they are in the evening on a Friday evening. And you wonder what to do coming from Delhi, living in the U.S. and then living in Singapore. And you're just so excited about this evening life and weekend life. That's also been a very positive adaptation is to have that space to yourself on weekends and, you know, do things that you do with your family or do things that you like by yourself because there's time. You're not seeking entertainment outside you're seeking that entertainment within even yesterday i remember when my husband and i were just walking in the evening on the streets of new york and there were areas that were very crowded and i remember telling him that i've never been very excited about standing in a long queue for a food stall to eat a certain type of food even when i was younger maybe a little bit but as a personality i realized that a lot of this entertainment is created because we are seeking entertainment outside we need to be entertained because many of us are very uncomfortable being with ourselves all alone, right? And that is a skill that I have mastered after living in Scandinavia because there was so much time and because there was no such external, you know, entertainment available 24 by 7. And you realize how powerful that is. So that is also a super positive adaptation. Otherwise, if I go back to my younger days and if when I was in the US, it would seem so foolish. Oh, you're in bed at nine o'clock because there's so much that's happening in the city. But fast forward today, whatever is happening in the city is not what I'm looking for to kill my time or to be entertained. You know, you can read or you can rest and you can talk to your family, catch up with your daughter, how the whole day has been after the summer camp. And those are the things that bring joy. So what was that second calling, which I would imagine you found, right? And that I'm sure you started looking forward to those four to six weeks every year. Firstly, I don't go off the grid. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The pace of work slows down because others are off the grid. And what I've learned is it's actually important for the pace to slow down as well because nobody can operate on a high pace all the time. So, true. so when it is a bit of a slow period, you focus on doing a lot of things that have been on your list that you have not able to prioritize. Now, whether it's work or private, well, of course, last about a year and a half or so, I've started writing on LinkedIn. So I think about, you know, the topics that I would like to write and I research and I put them down in my note ahead of time. A lot of reading for sure. And yeah, I think the other important thing I've learned is really clearing your brain. I think it's a 
skill one we need to master is when you completely empty your brain. I mean, it's like being in peace and you could be in a super busy, super demanding job. But at the end of the day, if you can take all that out and literally clear your brain and not have any clutter in it, that's a superpower for a long, sustained career or many other activities one would want to do if you know we are all living until our 80s so there's a, still good a good 40 plus years to go ahead so those are the things that i have learned to prioritize and getting super comfortable with being with myself or watch things that i'm interested in instead of doing something that's available outside for entertainment so i now make the choice for myself what is it that i want to do so what do those choices look like simran a um, lot of reading Definitely. I think exercise is on the top chart. Super important for me, more so now in 40s than it was before. A lot of home cooking. And my husband and I are very active in our kitchen. The kids get involved. And about three years, a little over three years now, I picked up transcendental meditation as well. I should be doing it every day, but there are days when I'm not able to do it, but I'm very conscious of it. So I think in my psychology, in the background, I sort of have that thing. And that also has been hugely helpful in getting to this space of clearing the mind. Mm. I didn't believe in it when I was younger. I didn't believe in any form of exercise that was slow, <laughs> perceivably. <laughs> but I am a complete convert when it comes to both meditation and yoga. They not only have the power to help you declutter your brain, they also have the power to rewire your brain, uh, rewire your thoughts. So that's something I also actively pursue when I have these slow pace periods, you know, usually around the summer and a little bit around end of the year, start of the new year. Lots to think about. Tell us more about your book choices. Like, what do you gravitate towards? So naturally, I gravitate to business and mm-hmm. business leaders. A lot of biographies I'm very interested in reading and also businesses, how the companies are built, how challenges are dealt. And off late, I've been very interested in looking at businesses who had a lot of money problems like Disney had, you know, yeah. uh, massive financial challenges. Then Dell had financial challenges. I mean, Dell's story is absolutely outstanding. How the CEO turned it around. And recently, a lot on India, what's happening within India and some Indian authors Right now, I am reading this one on PM Modi, which is actually written by a very accomplished leader, Mr. R. Bala Subramaniam, ex-academic in the U.S. Fiction, very rarely. Maybe A Thousand Splendid Sons. I loved that book when I read it. So that kind of fiction, once in a while, when somebody has a you know a high recommendation. Do I have a favorite book? I Yeah, I do. And it's interesting because it's not a business book. It's actually... Two books by an author called Michael A. Singer. His first book is The Untethered Soul. And then the other book is The Surrender Experiment. Those two books, I think, are have been life-changing for me about four years ago. And I highly recommend everybody, every leader to read. And today also leadership is changing. Leadership is also focused a lot on your inner well-being, your family background, your childhood history. Because you know, in many corporations, there's a lot of toxicity in leadership. And I think the main learning is that people are not bad. It's how their lives are shaped and how it articulates in their professional lives. So one of the things is very important for all of us to learn who may have had difficult childhood is, you know, don't bleed on others who didn't cut you. And that needs a lot of inner healing, and in our self-awareness that why those behaviors come out professionally. So those two books are very insightful and most importantly, Surrender Experiment that just literally talks about just do your best and you do your task and don't worry about the outcome. It's pretty much what Bhagavad Gita, one of our Indian famous teachings says that, you know, don't have right on the outcome or you shouldn't bother about it. Make sure that you have done your best and you have not left any stone unturned. So that's something I follow on a day-to-day basis because there are things you have absolutely no control over. Control is an illusion. When I was younger, I wanted to control everything. You know, I felt like I can control everything and I can get things done in a certain way. That is one of my most profound lessons of life. 
you have no control over anything and embrace uncertainty. Totally resonate with that. And I think this turning point came to my life also when I turned 50, when I realized that I had this controller in me, which was like, you know, super dominant. For me, it manifested as a mom. For some, it manifests as a leader. So I totally relate to what you're saying. Simran, did all these learnings and self-awarenesses help you describe your leadership style? Like you call yourself the quiet guardian. Yeah, I call it for a reason. It's because I am more of an introvert than an extrovert. And I think today, obviously, when I meet new people, they may not get that impression. And I say that openly that that's an acquired skill. While... I think it's well known introverts are great leaders, but all introverts have to master some sort of an extroverted skill because that's the need of the job, need of the profession. You can't be introverted and silent and be with yourself and then, you know, be also be a leader. The quite guardian part of the leadership comes from there, which means that I'm genuinely vested in people's careers as long as they are invested in their own careers themselves. I've been also very fortunate to have some amazing leaders and, you know, coaches and guides who are equally vested in my growth. So that's why the term quiet guardian is taking that focused, long term invested interest in people. Careers are not built in months or days or years. You know, it's a long journey and you have to also build a trusted relationship and in organizations such as IBM, where you have colleagues working for you know, decades. I've not even done my first decade here. It's really important to build those long-term relationships because you work across on many things over the years and that's how you know each other and the strengths and weaknesses of each other and help each other, you know, grow and be the champions, be the sponsors, men or women, regardless of the gender. Build that relationship over time, one-on-one, sometimes as part of a group setting, sometimes as part of a professional project. But have that one-on-one understanding of the human. You know, some of my colleagues, I feel like I'm close enough that just the way they are talking on a certain day, I would know something's wrong with them. And I'll pick up the phone and I would call them everything. Okay. You know, and I think nine out of 10 times, there's something not okay. You know, and that's something I truly believe in. In our fast-paced world, we can judge people really quickly, you know, on one bad performance, you know, when we are, of course, working and presenting and you know doing work we're almost all making a performance here and not every day even the best of the actors in the world can perform at their best that does not make them bad we just have to allow them that space that today is not their best day and not always i'm able to help but just asking them and allowing them the space to speak that okay they're having a difficult time and if there's anything i can you know help with so i think that's what for me is the quiet guardian and I have many leaders who are like the quiet guardians for me, you know, knowing me and making sure that I have the space to uh, sort of share sometimes what you're going through. Yeah. And I really want to double click on this. You talked about your supporters, your quiet guardians, your mentors, or earlier you've talked about your personal board of advisors, because I, again, can't agree with you more on this. You need people around you to guide you. But vulnerability, this asking for help doesn't come to people easily. So I'd love for you to share, how did you sort of create this journey for yourself? Was it organic? Was it intentional? I mean, many questions come to my mind. I mean, vulnerability is a very sensitive word. And it can also be perceived negatively if somebody makes that remark on you, oh, you're being vulnerable. And there's nothing absolutely wrong with that. You have to learn to find the right time right audience to be vulnerable. So one learning here is don't underestimate the emotions that you're feeling, but you have to always know what and when to react. One of the mistakes we always make, and I'm guilty of that also, right? That you think your emotion justifies your reaction. And if you don't react, you negate your emotion. And there are two separate things. You have to allow yourself, whatever you're feeling, it's okay. There's nothing wrong because it's an emotion and you're allowed to feel that good or bad exhilaration or sadness. But your reaction must always be careful because it's going to impact other people and yourself and your relationships. And I think learning to be vulnerable is also learning to be courageous. And that's something we all have to find our own way how to, you know, do it courageously and do it with people that you absolutely trust. 
that does not mean that sometime your trust will not be broken. And that's all right, because that is part of learning. You learn, you take the experience and you know next time you go do better. Maya Angela has a wonderful quote, right? Every time you did something, you did your best based on what you knew the best. But every time you uncover new learning, then you change and you do your best again. It's the same thing in business. You know, we have data and you have emotions and you have people and you make a decision. And some decisions pan out right, some don't. And then you go and uncover new data and then you make new decisions. And I also realized like if you are not vulnerable, you're doing a disservice to yourself because you're not allowing yourself to grow. You're holding it back all the time. Either it can push you or it can pull you back. You have to decide which one you want to sort of pick. I've had the other side as well, you know, hold myself back, not showing up or in the face of fear, just maybe not taking up on certain opportunities. Whereas now, fast forward today, it's exactly the opposite. Every opportunity that allows me to be out there, put my voice, my face on it, you know, I will do it. And another learning I've had also from our ex-CEO, Ginny Rometti, she says it a lot often now after retirement that when she was a CEO, she didn't want to talk a lot about women. And she realizes how important it was to do that in those 10, 12, 13 years as she was already in the position where her voice would be you know, heard. So it's very important for all of us to be out there, even in the face of fear, vulnerability, you know, whatever it feels, because there is no other way that I've come to learn. You just said I've also made these mistakes, right? So can you remember that mistake and what do you learn out of it? Yeah, you know, mistakes like sometimes overanalyzing or if somebody's not responding, assuming the person is not interested. Sometimes other people are just busy, you know, and you can always be calm and patient and keep going back. So a lot of such mistakes or, you know, sometimes brushing off also your own achievements as not a big deal. I remember one time an HR leader pointed out and she mentioned, you're not talking proudly about your lateral movements. You know how important they are in career, the lateral movements. And I didn't realize I was doing it, but I guess subconsciously I was doing it. And it was so helpful. And then, you know, I went and talked that through with her. And now I can amplify my lateral movements as a badge of honor. And even though they were accidental movements, I didn't plan for them. But, you know, when you thread your life's pearls together, you can create that story. And always remembering you have a reason and the other person is interested in having the dialogue, just go have it and don't worry too much about the outcome. And I think it's also been said many times, right? That when you are invited to have a seat at the table, then you please take the seat and don't second guess, why am I sitting here? Then you are sitting here because you are invited and your view matters. Focus on preparing for that view versus questioning why should I be sitting here? And even if you're questioning, I would say, keep it to yourself and still focus on preparing for, you know, being active participant on that table, having that conversation. Beautiful. Yeah. So, you know, two things Simran are standing out. One is, of course, vulnerability and the timing for it. And the second thing I think all you spoke about is that whole empathy, right? So, you know, everything you build is around empathy, the reaction, the response. So before we end, tell us a little bit about, you know, the She Knows Money Initiative, And I know you talked about financial feminism. So, you know, maybe just a little bit on that and it'll give us a chance to talk about the amazing work Madhura is doing as the founder of Aspire for her. Indeed. So it's going to be soon two years since I've known Madhura and the team at Aspire for her. And she's doing an amazing job to drive the agenda of bringing more women in workforce participation through, you know, education or employment or entrepreneurship. I was very interested in doing something meaningful, not just becoming a face on the mentor page. And I shared with her that I am quite interested in doing something around financial literacy. And we shared it with everybody in the entire trillion community, as she calls it, of women leaders. And from that, we came to this term, She Knows Money. And we basically started as, you know, very simple as a minimum viable product of financial literacy to see if there was interest in the market two years ago, just with some online sessions and sharing knowledge and bringing that awareness that women not just need to learn about all things financial literacy, but also have to take active action, have to make the investments, have to take the risk, have to win some, have to lose some. Otherwise, that confidence would never build up because then it's just a lot of theoretical knowledge. And it turned out that there was a lot of interest 
now Aspire for Her has officially taken this initiative as part of their portfolio. And, you know, there's a lot more focus on grassroots education as well. And I think Madhuran team are driving this forward amazingly well. I'm just fortunate that I got to be a small part of it. And, you know, she being a banker had the same emotion, you know, what does she know about financial literacy? But I think uh, she herself said she stands corrected that this is an important area that we need to drive. And I think her work, her platform gives this opportunity to drive this topic as well, equally further as everything else that Aspire for Her is doing. Yeah. So that's how really it. So we just tested the market and I'm really pleased that Aspire for Her is taking it forward. It's come a full circle, Simran. We started with the banker's perspective and we ended with understanding that <laughs> <laughs> you could add to the banker's perspective. So great. So looking back on your journey thus far, what advice would you give your younger self? Any insights or lessons you wish you had learned earlier in your career and life? Yeah, that's my favorite question. I have to say, I've come to learn that I don't give any advice to my younger self. I think I love that younger self because she was what she was at the time and she did the best she did what she knew. But yeah, today, what I've learned is self-reliance is very important. At the end of the day, with all your loved ones around, it is still a solitary journey because your ambitions are your own. You can have absolutely brilliant, supportive family, supportive life partners, supportive children. But in the end, it's you who has to know what you want to do and make sure that your loved ones are along because they are equally important as much as your passion, your career, your financial independence, whatever is important to anybody. So self-reliance would be number one for me. The second one, most importantly, will be embrace uncertainty. And if something is holding you back, find your tribe and discuss it with them. And thirdly, I would say emotional regulation. It's perceived that women have to do it more. I've learned over my 20 plus years of career that everybody has to do it. Everyone has moments where they need to get their emotions, you know, in check, which is why my earlier comment around you can feel everything, but the regulation is important on how it comes out, how your reaction and how objectively you deal with a situation. You can talk to your, you know, trusted people around that this is how I'm feeling. You can, you know, cry and went and whatever you want to do it in that small group where you are allowed to be vulnerable. But after that, I think we all have to get this in check and make sure we are staying objective about a situation once you've sort of dealt with your emotions. So I think those are my three strong learnings, which is embrace uncertainty, emotional regulation and self-reliance. Thank you, Simran. And I'm looking forward to bringing your journey to the listeners. Great. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure, Enma. Awesome. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, do hang on for just one more minute. I have a request for you. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Atlanta Diaries on Spotify, iTunes, or whichever platform you follow. Do join us in our mission to empower and inspire by sharing the podcast with a friend or colleague. It will be great if you can share on the social media platforms you follow, be it LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or any other. Please leave a review or rating on iTunes or Spotify. It really helps us reach a wider audience. Lastly, I wanted to share with you that many of my coaching clients and listeners have created a cheat sheet with their key takeaways from the episodes. I invite you to consider jotting down one or two key takeaways as you navigate your amazing journey. Have a wonderful rest of the day and see you next week for another inspiring journey on Atlanta Diaries.